Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, so, first of all, welcome to Core CPP. I'm really excited about the conference this year. Uh, it's been an amazing conference so far, and we already just started. Um, so, thank you for coming, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy the conference. As Adi have said, feel free to approach everyone, even if you haven't talked with them before, uh, kindly <laughs> and nicely. And, and feel free to talk about C++, as I will do today. Um, okay, so welcome uh, to my talk, uh, Customization Methods, Connecting User and Library Code. And let's start. So I'll talk very briefly about uh, who am I. I'm a C++ developer at SolarEdge. I'm also an active member of Workgroup 21, the ISO standardization uh, of C++. Um, I love software design. I also love cataloging, which is one of the reasons I am giving this talk today. I hope you'll enjoy it. So today, uh, we're going to talk about customization points, and we're going to start with defining what are customization points. We'll see an overview of the valuable customization points methods. We'll compare them in different, um, and under different uh, conditions and terms. And then we're gonna see what's next for C++ in um, the topic of customization points. Now, Walter uh, gave me a great uh, preview <laughs> because he brought the topic as well and I hope uh, after this talk, you'll have even more uh, things to think about uh, in this topic. And both of the first topics will also include some history, so we'll see uh, what was uh, done so far. So let's start with what are customization points. So we have here a piece of code. Uh, this code is a logger, and we have a library logger. It's something quite basic. And we wanna be able to use some user-defined type in our logger. We want to be able to get some information from the user about how do I print this type's information. So libraries are something that is often being shared between different developers, often in different parts of the world, not always speaking the same language even. And I want to be able to create this logger on one side, for example, by Alice, and correctly communicate to Bob on the other side of the world what he needs to do in order to fit to my logger. So this is not a trivial question in my mind. So just to briefly overview what we see here, but we'll see more details later, this is overloading of the operator, right? And then when we call libblogger and give user type, for example, Bob's type, we're able to get the result that Bob defined. So this is what we wanted. So let me uh, briefly uh, read to you the definition from Wikipedia on libraries, a software library. A software library is a collection of non-volatile resources used by computer programs, often for software development. But as I mentioned, a library, uh, this, this code we're discussing is often shared between different developers, possibly from different parts of the world. They need to be able to communicate. Okay, this is the key point here. And customization points are the means on which we are trying to connect library and user code. So the term was first mentioned by Eric Nibbler in a blog post from 2014. And this is the name, you're most welcome to uh, visit the link and read a very interesting article. And later appeared in a paper by Eric as well, and he defined it as uh, like this. Customization point, as we will be discussed in this document, Eric means his document, of course, is a function used by the standard library that can be overloaded on user-defined types in the user's namespace and that is found by argument-dependent lookup, okay? So this is the definition from 2014 by Eric Nibbler. But in this talk, I'll use something a bit broader. A customization point for this talk 
is an integration method exposed by a library that can be used by the user to customize or hook some functionality according to their needs. Okay, and this is broader. We don't talk about any technical details here like ADL. Um, we'll see later a few different methods. So we also have uh, some brief overview on Eric's uh, original customization points during this talk, and we'll refer to them as original customization points. So don't get confused. And we've now reached our first conclusion. Customization points are a mean of integration. So users need to be able to understand what do they need to integrate with, which customization points exist. They need to be able to opt in. That means to explicitly tell the library what they want. They need to avoid accidentally opting in, which means over somehow a stepping over the library implementation when they didn't intend to. And Barry Resvin talked about this, uh, all those points and more in a paper, a very interesting paper, which I also recommend on. We need language mechanism for customization points. Now we're basically, the um, journal lines here are gonna talk very similar to the paper, but I also recommend you to go and uh, read it, and it's a very interesting paper in my mind. So we just reached to our second conclusion. Customization points are means of communication. I already mentioned that, but that's, I think it's a very important thing to remember. Uh, so customization points uh, determines which entities are shared between the library and the user. It can, it's not necessarily functions, right? We, we saw something in the lines of functionality, it's an operator, but never mind. But it can also be data and terminology. Okay, if I uh, use a using statement and the user can use the same type, then we have sharing of terminology. If I define some const uh, pi, that is a, another thing that the user can maybe use in their namespace, in their code, and the library defined for them. So we'll focus on user type sharing entities with libraries, but libraries also share uh, uh, functionality and terminology and data with other libraries. Uh, that's, I would think, a more complex case, but uh, we'll not focus on that in the stock. And we've just reached our third conclusion, customization points in our means to embed specification. Okay, so if I want to define what pi is in my world, in my domain, and the user use my library, I can define something for them to also use in their code, and this affects their code. So to summarize, customization points are means of integration, they are means of communication, and also they are means to embed specifications. So let's do a short detour. Um, this is one of the more complex parts of the language. I still think it's useful here. Now, this talk, I want to emphasize, this talk is not aimed to go to all, every single detail uh, of, of those uh, technical uh, connections. I will mention um, technical details, but this is actually a very important um, uh, aspect of the language that you have to know in order to understand where the complexity comes from. So, to compile a function call, our compiler creates a list of candidates, okay? It needs to discover which function is the one that is appropriate, that it, which function is the one that the user uh, intended to call. So uh, in order to find the correct function, we are uh, performing a process called overload resolution. So function candidates are picked according to function name. We have a few functions that are called foo. All of them will be picked, generally speaking. This may include template argument detection, and I'll uh, define it uh, very soon, <laughs> and argument-dependent lookup. So template argument deduction is function templates with the same name create additional candidates. Okay, so if I have a foo regular function, free function, and I have a template function foo, and if the conditions fit, the template function will create additional candidates for my overload, for my overload resolution. Argument-dependent lookup is um, in fact, that the function foo that we just uh, called from the user space, okay, uh, 
is not only being searched by the same namespace on which it's been called. It's also being searched in the namespace according to the types being transferred, okay? So this is really, really important. This is something that is uh, quite advanced. Uh, people may lose it, uh, may miss it at least uh, until they run into really complex errors and then they find out that the compi compiler is doing not exactly what uh, they expected. So this is something very, very interesting uh, that we have in C++. And as I mentioned, it's not only in the function call namespace, also in the arguments namespace. And there's additional rules that I'm not going to uh, go too deep into them, uh, but the rules are very, very long. <laughs> so again, to summarize, to compile a function call, the compiler must first perform name lookup, which may involve argument-dependent lookup. Okay, so we're also searching in the uh, user in the uh, called arguments uh, user space. Uh, sorry, space, and also a function template may be followed by template argument deduction. If those pr produce more than one candidate, then overload resolution is a process to dis to discover which candidate is the most fitting. Again, I'm simplifying. And then, if the results is ambiguous, uh, compilation will fail, most of the cases. We also have something that is called Sfina, but again, it is not uh, really uh, relevant to this talk. But uh, in some cases, it will not fail. But in general, if you provide something that is ambiguous to the compiler, the compiler will yell at you and fail. So we have now just finished uh, uh, describing what is customization point. And uh, the next topic is we're going to see which customization points exist in C++. So C++ was born with some types of customization points. And we will go over the following um, types. So inheritance. You may be not used to uh, talking about inheritance in this aspect, but this is actually a type of customization point. A class template specialization. The original customization point, which I just mentioned, by, defined by Eric. Customization point objects, additional uh, interesting thing. Concepts are also, can also be referred to as customization points. In some cases, they are widely used in the Rangers library. And deducing this, uh, which is a new feature, uh, voted into C++23, think a very interesting one um, if you care about generic code. Tagging, tag invoke, which did not make it into the standard. Customizable functions, which are not in the standard yet, but are considered for 26. And reflection, which is not in the standard yet, but we don't know when we'll get it. We're hopefully in 26. What? Yes. <laughs> Uh, this says uh, 2030. So any questions so far about the topic before we dive in into those different top, uh, types of customization points? Any comments? Do you care about, uh, are you excited about this topic? I think it's an awesome topic. <laughs> but, you know. So um, I just, as I mentioned before, we will skip over some of the details. I, uh, all the code snippets are marked with numbers. There's like little numbers uh, beside the slides, and you can later go and uh, experiment with the code snippets and uh, see how that works. So let's start. So uh, generally during the presentation, I'm going to split uh, into library and user uh, code areas. Now, again, generally speaking, the library will be the library namespace, the user will be the user namespace, but that's not necessarily like that. So I'm, uh, at least in the customization points, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, the, first, the first parts I'm skipping over that and there's some namespaces uh, uh, complexity that I'm ignoring, but uh, again, the, this is uh, meant to just deliver the points and uh, we'll go over the general uh, form. So on the library side, we can define some functionality and we can also define data and terminology in this method, right? Even though you didn't thought of pi as, uh, you know, as terminology, it is actually a kind of terminology that you give to your user to use. Um, you can either 
define that the interface is mandatory, or you can say that the interface have default. So like, for some case, and this is an interesting point, for some cases, it's reasonable to provide a default. For some cases, what, you, uh, what the library writers think that makes sense actually makes sense. For some cases, this is, this is not true. So we also, when we write a library, for example, or either when we are users of a library, we need to take this under consideration. We need to think, is the regular implementation, is the regular logic, is the maybe trivial logic make sense in my case? Do I need to do something specific for my type? So we can also, as, assuming we have what we expected, assuming that we define the interface, for example, we define func2, we can now count on that to use that in different algorithms that we provide in the library. So if we know that we have a function called func2, we can call it. We can expect what it's going to do. The user will need to inherit, it from, uh, inherit from lib type, right? Sorry. And user can also pass use type object to this lib algo that we defined, assuming they did what we uh, expected them to do, assuming they implemented func2, right? Or use the default, whichever function that we're referring to. And we get the expected behavior. So let's go over the characteristics of inheritance regarding customization, well, addressing customization points problem. So we can share interface functionality and data and terminology as a group, right? We define this class, we can define different things in it, and the user get everything. It's easy to opt in, you can't accidentally opt in. You write something explicit in the user space, you write something explicit in the user code to say, I want to inherit from this thing. There are limits on return type, uh, but there are some methods to, uh, to go over, uh, around this. And there's also runtime overhead, uh, but we can also do some very complex tricks uh, in compile time, for example, CRTP. I'm not going there uh, at this talk, but, but we, we need to keep that in mind that inheritance in general is something that is done uh, dynamically, the simple kind, at least. And this is not intrusive into library namespace. We define this in library, we can do something in user side. It is intrusive into the type, so the user have to do something, you have to change their type in order to fit to whatever requirements we defined. And just notice there's term intrusive containers that have nothing to do with that. <laughs> and examples are everywhere, right? Everyone who ever learned a course in C++ probably use inheritance at some point, inheritance. So we're familiar with that. So let's look at class template specialization. So in, within class template specialization, we can do two things. We can specialize a type. We can also do something a bit different, which is using a functor, defining a functor. I'm going to go over both of them very briefly, but uh, keep in mind this is, this is relatively similar um, in terms of technical details. So on the library side, library defines template class lib type with deleted CTOR, for example. We're trying to, pre to prevent from the user uh, doing something that we don't want them to. And library defined this lib algo, making some assumptions. And the user needs to over override the entire specialization, sorry, the entire implementation, uh, by uh, template specialization. In this case, this is oversimplified. I'm just um, trying to show you the general um, form before we go in uh, deeper. But we don't get to uh, we don't get to give the user terminology and data like we did before, right? And also in this specific case, this code snippet that I've shown that is oversimplified. We override some functionality as well. We can override the whole class. We're basically saying, I have something that fits to your type, okay, from the user side. We say, I have something that fits to your type, but there's no way for the library to sort of make sure that that's true on this slide. And again, this is simplified code. We'll say a different one on the next slide. 
And user can instantiate and use this uh, lib type with their user as expected and gain the functionality even though they uh, override some of it. So we can also do it a bit different. We can also uh, define some uh, uh, specifically lib type uh, type and also if you notice here I'm I'm only overloading this lib type and foo function. Okay, so I overload the constructor and the foo function. So here I'm able to take some things from the library as a user. I'm able to take some things from the library, but I'm also able to uh, do my own implementation on top of it. Okay, this is the foo implementation. And again, we can instantiate on the user side this lib type user type and get whatever we expected. So think about the logger example before. Okay, in this case, we can have a logger and we can implement, for example, print int. Okay, and we have, for example, a user type that contains int and, I don't know, string. And we can implement print int, but then get from the user print string. Okay, we can, we can combine those functionalities together and get something that includes both of them. Okay. And then when we call this libalgo, we call foo from the user. Right? So now, uh, any questions so far? This is a complex method. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Lib algo. No, it's a special, it's great. No, libalgo can only, what, sorry? Lib type of user type is, is a specialization of library type. And the libalgo can only, okay, so here, yeah, I, I added this comment says, you can limit this by concept, it, you can, it's not on this slide. We'll talk about concepts a bit later, but basically you're right that here there's no way to verify. You're, you're correct. Uh, but the general, uh, again, so the, the idea is that libalgo can only take types that comprehend with, like, that did this specialization of foo. You can actually do uh, the libalgo receive the lib type brackets. Yeah, I know. I don't want to combine concepts here because I have concepts on a different slide, so... Uh, yeah. No. Wait, wait, wait. I can't hear all of you together. Yes, yeah, sorry. No, you don't need that. That. So if you don't uh, feel comfortable with just looking at the slide, which makes sense because this is complex, feel free to go into the code snippets, play with this, and get the feeling of what happens here better. But again, I'm also saying this is oversimplified code. Most of the slides are not going to contain all the details. But this actually works. So, so go and, and use the code snippets. So we're now moving to a functor. This is also a class template specialization, but this is a functor. Everyone knows what a functor is? Anyone doesn't, uh, is not sure what a functor is and want me to briefly define? Sure. So a functor is basically a class that have uh, usually operator uh, parentheses, uh, so you can call the type, like in, you can instantiate this type and then call uh, type operator parentheses and this looks like uh, a function, right? This is a functor. And um, yeah, we use this very, uh, we use this quite a lot in all sort of uh, cases uh, in our code. So in this case, library can implement function template, for example, this operator that I just mentioned. And we can all either have some default or we can do delegation. We can basically inside this operator call uh, code from user side. Uh, we can either do nothing in the default or we can do something in the default, just like we saw in inheritance, if you remember. There is important point to be said in favor of inheritance that we can say that we want something virtual, um, uh, pure virtual, and then uh, demand from the user to give us the implementation. And here is a bit different, but we can still do uh, the two things. 
Okay, so we call this operator. And on the user side, user overrides implementation by template specialization or inheritance. You can also inherit from this uh, functor type thing. Okay, you get similar behavior. And you can call uh, the lib user func. This is the functor basically. Okay, what you see there with the user type. Okay? So this is similar um, technical details to what we saw before, but in terms of um, functionality and behavior, it's, it's different. So we, I split them into two slides. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can either have a default to do nothing or have a default to do something. And that, again, depends on so what do you think it depends on? I wonder if anyone listened to my uh, first. Uh, is it something technical? Is it something in the logic? You can scream and sh like, shout, whatever you think. Yechezka. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so that's, that. that is correct. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah. This is my point. It's not something technical. It's something that really involves the logic of our code. What we want, what, how do we want to use the library? What does our code do? Okay. And user override implementation by specialization, like we saw before, but you get something a bit different because now you can call the default without giving without doing the specialization in your site. You can basically get this default function and call 42. You didn't define anything for this 42 to work because you have a default. Okay, um, so let's summarize the characteristics of this method. So namespace, uh, this have to be shared, uh, the namespace, uh, I mean, when you define something, you have to share it uh, with the library namespace in some way. It can either be the uh, enclosing namespace, it can either be um, intrusive into the library namespace, but there's like different ways to do it, but you have to change something. You have to, yeah. And default implementation can be provided, as we saw. If default exists, uh, we don't get errors. So in the first slide when I, show, uh, when I uh, showed, sorry, uh, deleted implementation will get some compiler's errors. The compiler will tell us, you're not implementing this thing that, that because it's deleted and I can't, I can't call it. But if we do provide this default, we don't get this, uh, this um, protection from the compiler. And there's no mechanism to uh, verify uh, this behavior, again, when I'm putting concepts aside, which we'll see in the next few slides. And a good example for uh, this method, and now we get into real examples, is fmtlib. fmtlib uh, uses this type version thing that we just saw of template specialization. And um, as you probably know, uh, we have fmt in uh, uh, C20. So uh, you can probably deduce that this is a good library. It works really uh, awesome. So let's now talk about the origin customization points on which uh, the ones that Eric defined. And he defined his customization points using ADL. So I mentioned ADL before. It's a complex mechanism of the language. We don't always love how it works. We don't, only, we don't always like um, working with it. It can be confusing. So we have here, uh, for example, of what is a very basic example of how ADL works. We have here two different versions of this libfunc, right? We have one with const t and one with t. And the method relies on the fact that the proper function will be called. So it also allows porting types behavior from the user. Like, what I mean by that is that if, user, if the user cares which one of those will be called, he, they can do something on their side in order to, to explicitly to force the proper call if they are familiar with, with this, uh, with what happens in the library side, right? But as I mentioned, overload resolution, which is a different word, a way to say which function will be called, is affected by ADL. 
And ADL can be affected by template specialization in the closing namespace, by template specialization in library namespace, by non-template function in user space, by non-template function in user spaces in friends. So as you can probably understand by now, this is not simple. ADL is not a simple mechanism to communicate with the user. And we use it all the time, especially in the standard library. So let's look at some real life uh, story example uh, of swap. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, Walter uh, did a preview, <laughs> and we're now going to look at the swap fiasco. Um, OK, so this question was asked 13 years ago. How to overload student swap? OK. So someone answers, the right way to overload student swap is uh, suit stop implementation is uh, by uh, adding friend function to your user type, like we see here. And we're gonna, we're gonna see it a bit again later, so don't feel obligated to comprehend all the code right now. In, 20, uh, uh, in 2003, it's best uh, unspecified. Most implementations do not use ADL to find swap. Someone answers. Uh, it's not mandated. It's not mandated. Someone answers, I would surprise to find that implementation still don't use ADL, uh, implementation that still don't use ADL to find correct swap. This is an old issue in the committee. This is from uh, 2011. The person A that we saw before answers, somebody, somebody should check what happens in MSVC. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> and at this point, I'm going to tell you that those people, A and B, are uh, members of the C++ standard committee. So, <laughs> I would think it's a bit sad. Um, this is where we end up. This continues. I don't think it's a good idea, et cetera, et cetera. Someone suggests that DCC is not, uh, compel uh, it's not standard approved. It's not um, compelling to the standard. I don't think that's true. DCC is probably <laughs> at least most of it. <laughs> um, they keep arguing and uh, yeah, as I mentioned, they're both in the standards committee. But the last, the last comment on this was made in February this year, okay? And this was, I made this talk a bit before I found this comment. I, know I probably missed it or something. And then later I went back to this uh, Stack Overflow thread and I've noticed <laughs> this um, comment that was made specially for me. And I call this person person S because it's uh, some poor soul programming in C++ <laughs> that you have to ask such questions um, 13 years after something has been added or more. Actually, this is a question after. So yeah, let's see what the friend is doing there. All right, so we're now talking a bit about ADL. And again, I'm warning you, this is a complex mechanism, I'm not sure it's the best one we have, but let's see what it does so we can uh, criticize it later. <laughs> and on the library size, library defined this utility. This utility can be used by uh, libalgo, as I mentioned before, uh, just like with the previous slides. And on the user side, user can override implementation and trying to be discovered by ADL. Okay, this is, this is the user the user's role in this, in this communication. User needs to um, be able to be discovered. So um, friend function is a really great uh, way to do it. And the reason is that this friend function that we see, okay, so we now added the friend keyword to the user side uh, function libfunc. This friend function that we see here is basically making this uh, lib, uh, lib func, uh, f um, sorry, um, function be discovered in the enclosing namespace of user type. So basically it's just like writing this lib function outside of the class user type and defining uh, the first param as user type. It's basically doing the same thing. And what the, the benefit of using frame function on, uh, and not doing this on the uh, namespace outside is that the compiler have, uh, like, we make it easier for the compiler to consider the overload set. So basically, I'm not a compiler developer. I haven't uh, 
tested, uh, I haven't benchmarked that, but in general, um, the compiler have less candidates in the overload set because the only uh, stage on which this lib func is being added to the overload set is the last stage. It's not like in the beginning when you collect uh, all the candidates, uh, it's later. And that can actually Im uh, impact performance of the compiler when compiling this code. So yeah. Um, okay, so the term for this friend uh, marked function thing that has been discovered externally is hidden friend because it's hidden from the global scope. And again, you're most welcome to uh, search uh, more about this. Yeah. But if you, if you had, if you've uh, stumbled across the problem of, of overloading swap from the standard library, you probably already um, met this uh, solution. So let's summarize the characteristics of this method. So porting functionality to user type, uh, from user type into the uh, um, uh, lib space is possible, right? Not easy, but possible. It's not intrusive into the lib, uh, lib space. It is intrusive into um, the, user, the user type, which means that the user have to do something explicitly, just like before. And ADL is complex, I think you'll all agree with me. And good examples for this kind of a behavior is the operator that we saw on the first slide when I talked about customization points, but also std swap, std begin, std end, etc. So you've probably noticed that there's a problem here, and the committee also noticed that problem. So they thought of different ways to solve this problem, not, not doing what we just saw for std swap. And the paper uh, suggested design by customization points that I mentioned before uh, prevented, presented some issues about std swap that you're already familiar with. So for example, when we call std swap, we want to do it in two stages because we, wanna, we don't want to call explicitly the std swap from the uh, standard library. We want to give a chance to the user type to be, uh, the, the, the user defined swap to be discovered. So we have to do this in two steps. And this is, of course, a source of errors. And users can basically bypass any constraints. So if I would have add, like I would, you can't do that because that would be a break. But say, for example, that I would add some constraints to the standard library swap. If we bypass, if the user bypass this uh, standard library swap, then we got, don't get this uh, constraints. And even, so to solve those issues, Eric um, presented customization point objects. So this is a different way to do something very similar to what we see using ADL, but with a different method. So if you recall, yeah. So we can define a template function, just like before. And then we can create this lib func uh, functor. Okay, so we already saw functor. And the library needs to create this global uh, functor object so that that thing would be called when we call this name. But there's a problem with creating this global object because the compiler is unhappy with having function names and object names on the same namespace having the same name. <laughs> So we need to do something to solve this. We need to be able to call libfunk and get to this global object that you see down there that is now forbidden to be um, created. And again, the delegation is not really important here, so I don't address it, but that's the point. So Eric suggested this really, really complex method to do that. And again, I'm not going to go over the details of that here. But this method is basically trying to uh, make the compiler, force the compiler identify your functor instead of this, of, instead of function, and manipulate ADL in a different way than what we saw before. And this actually works. <laughs> okay, this is, this is a nice method. Uh, we can use it, yes. Um, 
So we can get all the benefits of ADL, basically, but we also uh, neglect some of the downsides. And this is, this is why this method is awesome. It still needs to reserve names globally. We still need this functor. This functor actually takes over the name, right? We can't use the same name that we used for the functor. And this is a complex mechanism, etc. But as I mentioned, it works. And that's why we have ranges swap in the standard library these days. Ranges swap is using this, uh, this technique to, not, to, to basically be able to take all the calls back to the library, and then the library can decide whether it wants to call the user-defined swap or the standard library swap without having the user manipulate ADL in weird ways. So that's awesome. Okay, so we've now reached the concepts and they came up uh, earlier. I don't have much time, so I'm just gonna start for questions uh, at the end of, of the talk. Um, Okay. So, yeah. okay, so let's talk about concepts very briefly. And again, uh, all those topics can be really extended, so there's a lot to talk about each one of them, but I'm, not going, I'm only going to refer to them in customization points uh, aspect. So concept can be used to co in code which is very similar to what we saw before. And if you recall, I wrote this comment saying that you can't limit, uh, I don't remember, uh, your name, but you asked, uh, you, you talked about how I can limit those things. So yeah, I can limit them using concepts, okay, which is good because I limit them on compile time. I make sure that I identify the error on, on time or at least as early as, early as I would have hoped. And the concept, basically I define their lib concept that requires something, whatever, or a lib concept tag, okay, something to be defined in the user side which is called lib concept tag. And I can only accept types that are uh, co um, co um, compelling to this uh, concept that I defined. So basically, I'm forcing the user to do something in order to fit to my algorithm. In this case, define lib concept tag. User define lib concept tag however they wish. And then they can actually use my algorithm. So this is not like, this is not the basic use, usage of concept, but this is something that allows us to communicate, again, between the user and the library. And let's look at the characteristics of this method. This is clear and expressive code. Comparing to the previous uh, methods that we saw, I think this is really simple. This is not namespace or type intrusive. Uh, Putting aside the fact that you have to define this tag, it's debatable, but you don't have to explicitly define the function as expected or something along those lines. This name still needs to be uh, reserved globally because we, this concept capturing the name. And library need to be careful uh, when it's applying these concepts because if, for example, I have int and double, things like that, I may I, may, I, I need to take under consideration the concepts in my namespace, and this also may clash. It's not exactly as terrible as ADL is, but it's still uh, something to consider. And there's additional type of concepts that I'm not gonna uh, talk about in this talk, but I also welcome you to go and search for them. They were considered into C++, but eventually didn't enter. And they have something a bit different in regards to limitations. They allow a bit ex more extended limitations. And a good example for something that uses concept is the Rangers library at some point. Okay, so we've now reached to the parts when we're talking about what we have in C23 and what we may have in uh, future versions of C++. So I hope you're uh, hopeful as I am <laughs> regarding the future of C++ by now. <laughs> So let's start with deducing this. Deducing this is a feature that was accepted for C++23, um, presented by uh, Gashper Osman, Cy Brand, Ben Dean, and Barry Resvin. And it allows specifying, uh, specifically deciding, uh, de specifying the deduced uh, value category of the type of this, of the class. Okay, so 
Here we have an example of something that is very common in libraries. You have to overload the function, the sum function, libfunc, in this example, according to the appropriate value category of, uh, sorry, according to the appropriate type of the um, class, okay? So I have here something for const, etc. And deducing this allows you to do something like that very similarly, but only if you, if you, can, if you can recognize, we accept as the first parameter the type of the, the, the this, the this pointer, okay? So this is a different way to do the same thing. Deducing this allows the thing uh, down. Uh, before deducing this, we could, we could only do the thing up. And this is nice, but what it actually gives us is the ability to use templates to define all those three functions together or more. It could be all, more overloads. We can basically define all of them using a single template, forwarding, reference, etc. all the uh, fun that templates give us. So it's interesting in regards to customization point because you can do something very similar to CRTP, uh, which I have a different talk about. In 2019, I actually talked about CRTP in this conference. It was my first talk. <laughs> so you can do something very similar to CRTP using deducing this. And again, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, it's something that behaves like in inheritance, but only done in compile time. So we save some of the overload, overhead sorry, of uh, runtime inheritance, and of course it's limited and it's a complex method, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so on the library side, library can define this lib type, okay? And library, uh, lib type defines this lib algorithm to template, which can be ported, um, functionality can be ported. And on the user side, user defines user type inheriting from this lib type to get something that is very similar to CRTP. Again, CRTP is like inheritance in compile time. So we get all the goods of, C of uh, inheritance without the overhead of runtime uh, dispatching, basically. And this is all being uh, uh, allowed by explicit self-template parameter, which was added in deducing this feature. And of course, we can also do something more general for the return type. There's additional uh, complexity there. Um, I mean, additional features that we can uh, we can actually use of templates, but we can we can have things that are extended. So, I think this is again comparing to what we saw before: clear and expressive code. This is non-intrusive. User doesn't need to add code to lib space. They basically just define their side. No need to reserve name globally. And you can explicitly opt in, and you may accidentally opt in, but that's, that's still not trivial to do that. But there's no examples that I can give to you yet for some libraries that use that, because this is too new. Hopefully in the next talk. Yeah, I meant in C++, of course. We have here uh, um, Shahar Shemesh, which, yeah. <laughs> which advocate for D. <laughs> or not advocating for D, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I'll tell Alexei Andersonovsky that you said that. <laughs> okay, so tag invoke. So, again, to summarize, as you can see, we have a problem in the C++ language. We want to be able to do a proper customization points. This problem, even though it looks like some old problem that we already solved, is not actually solved. And there are additional ways, uh, people keep offering additional ways to solve this thing. And one of those ways is tag invoke. Now, tag invoke is a library solution for this. We saw some, some of the things that we saw were Language solution, this is a library solution, okay? This is something that we're trying to do in the library side in order to invoke a specific functionality without using complex things like that we saw before. And this was proposed in a paper um, by Lewis Baker, Eric Nibbler, uh, I've mentioned already, also the implementer of Rangers Library, I hope you heard about him, and Kirk Schupp. And this targeted C++ 23, 
as I mentioned, it's targeted, it, it have targeted C++ 23, but it didn't actually get vote, got voted in. And the example that you see here, I don't have enough time, I think, to go over, but the example that you see here is based on a library called duck invoke, we, uh, basically a header file that, is, that was implemented by uh, Rene Fernandez Rivera Moral. Again, uh, code snippet is in the link and you're welcome to play, uh, uh, experience, ex experience with that. There are a few other implementations, but in general, this is relatively a complex implementation. So very briefly, I'm gonna go over what's going on here. Library defines this libtag object. Can do this in macro. If in duck invoke, it's been done with macro. Doesn't have to be. Library defines this lib func, which delegates to this tag that we saw. The macro is being expanded to two things, two main things, a static struct, okay, and a reference that is referring to the struct. And this is basically a way to, um, to bypass the limitations of not being able to define the object in the global scope, et cetera, that we saw before. The user basically need to do relatively simple thing. He needs to, they need to define user uh, for, for their user type tag invoke function. This have to be called tag invoke, okay? This is a reserved word in, in this proposal at least. And they have to pass this lib tag in as a first param, as you can see both in the example for user, uh, user func one and user func two. They pass this uh, tag in order to say that they care about this functionality, this tag that the lib library defined as a first param. And then when they call uh, libfunc with their type, with their defined type, they get the proper functionality passing through the library and being called as hoped. Okay, so to summarize the difference, you can see uh, the first param in libfunc, the top example takes user func one, the bottom example takes user func two. Basically, you only include this duck invoke library and implement what you can see in the user side, and then the proper functionality is being called as you'd expected. But this is trying to do something very complex in the library side with no help from the um, language. So people were wondering, should we try to do it on the language side. Compiler is our friend. <laughs> we can try and make the invoke being done instead of the library in the compiler, in the language side. So again, I'm gonna skip this uh, additional examples because I don't have enough time, but tag invoke solves almost all the problems that we saw before. Only problem is that this is complex. Also have some, uh, by the way, uh, overhead, um, a performance overhead because when it's trying to be done on library side. And you can communicate in a limited way with the user. Diagnostics are complicated. Still, we get some examples of functions that uh, use this uh, method. So I just want to um, say one short word about student execution. Student execu execution was considered into we have, by the way, an uh, author here of, of the paper, so feel free to nag her later. Um, <laughs> but it uh, was considered into C++23. It's a way to do, um, uh, it's a way to have uh, execution in the standard library and eventually didn't get in, among other things, because the tag invoke mechanism that was considered to be used was not finalized. So, People didn't feel comfortable with tag invoke, and that's how we got customizable functions. So just like tag invoke in the, in the library, we have this proposal currently being considered for 26. I don't think it was voted, I don't think it was, no, it was discussed but not voted yet, if I'm not mistaken. And it proposed in the paper um, customization point functions and later re -proposed, re was reproposed in a paper 
by Lewis Baker, Quarantine Jabot, and Jeff, uh, Jasper um, Asman. And the idea here that the user can implement in user space as a hidden friend, if you remember, we saw something very similar. You can see here syntax that looks a bit like what you see in inheritance. There's equal zero, pure virtual function things, right? But this is template functions. These are not regular functions. By the way, the syntax is not final, so feel free to propose your ideas of how do we, how do we make that better. <laughs> but in general, what you're trying to do is do something that is that looks very similar to what you do with inheritance, only do that with template functions, and drop the overhead of uh, dynamic dispatch from, not pay the overhead. And as I mentioned, this solves a lot of the problems we saw before. You don't need to reserve names globally. Only downside is that it's not in the language yet, in my mind, at least. In what way is this intrusive? Yeah, so intrusiveness, in the, you're right. Intrusiveness, intrusiveness into the type is like a debatable feature. I, I would, like, it's something that is debatable. But yeah, you, you're right. It's, it, the, the user have to do something, of course. Yeah. Does it have to be a friend? The syntax that proposed in the, at least in the version on which I've looked at I wrote this talk a few months ago, and the, in the version that I uh, seen, yeah, the friend is uh, part of the syntax. But uh, as I mentioned, this is considered for C++ 26, and if anyone is interested in debating with the others about the syntax, they'll be happy to get some inputs. Okay. Um, okay. So as. I'll very briefly uh, go over reflection because it's not in the standard yet. I'm just going to briefly mention what reflection have to do with customization points. Um, yeah. So reflection is basically a way to take some code from the user, for example. But we could theoretically with reflection take some code from the user, break it into different uh, components, and then reassemble it as we would like. So this is not classic customization point thing, but you could basically look at reflection as a way to modify user code according to the library needs, and in that context, reflection can be used for that. So the user basically don't need to do anything in this case. The library uses reflection to break the user code into parts and reassemble it and get the functionality that we want. But as you understand, the user is not controlling uh, what happens here. So the question that I want to bring is, can reflection be the ultimate customization point? Some people suggest that it can be. I don't think so. Okay, so this is the summary of all the different methods that we saw. And again, as I mentioned, this is a work in progress. So if you're interested in this topic, if you're interested in contributing to this really, really hard to solve problem, I would be very happy to talk with you and I'll be happy to get emails from you. And I think this is something that we need to take under consideration for the following years. We probably want to be able to provide some well, uh, easy to use methods to do customization and not deal with this kind of uh, efforts. Okay, so this is what's next, as I mentioned, and would love to get your input. Thank you everyone for listening. <laughs>